this morning as we are almost ready to get started, let me just remind you again the importance, not just being a hearer of the word, but a doer. And we'll be very practical this morning. Uh, this is a very uh, simple, straightforward message, as you'll see in the moments ahead. But if we can put the principles that I will be sharing into some degree of application, I think we will all be the better for it. It's always good to see you folks. I welcome you to New Life, whether it's your first time, first time in a while, if you're a regular attendee here, or if you're joining us online, it's always good to see you. I want to just kind of launch right in this morning and make the note that as I look back now upon almost 20 years of Christianity, in 15 or so years of, of pastoral ministry, I am grateful for the mentor figures that God has given to me. How many of you in the sound of my voice, along the course of your spiritual journey, there have been mentor figures, men and women of, of greater experience and maturity that have poured into your life and helped to fashion you into the person that you are today. If you have never really had a mentor figure, you need to pray about that. And I don't really care how old you are. You, you might have been walking with the Lord for 40 years. Uh, if you've never really had that, there's such benefit in that. I think we always need to have three layers or levels of relationship. Mentors is number one. There has to be somebody pouring into your life, and preferably someone where there is some one-on-one -on -one contact. I mean, this to a degree is a bit of a mentoring or a coaching relationship, but it's one person speaking to a group. The one-on-one -on -one setting really has benefit. We also need to have peers for the journey. You gotta have friends, uh, preferably at times like-minded friends who can support you and encourage you and challenge you in the faith, and also people that you're pouring into. Don't answer this question out loud, but are there people in your life that you are strategically investing of yourself in? If not, let me challenge you to consider why. Be prayerful about that because you all have stories and experiences and, and, and a capacity to greatly influence those who are newer to the faith. Not even necessarily uh, younger people. I mean, how many of you, well, let's, I'm not going to ask this question out loud, but there are people who are older than I am this morning, and you're benefiting from what the Lord has given to me, and vice versa. We're all in this thing together, but I digress. I am thankful for the mentor figures that I've had along the journey. Uh, mentors, again, play such a pivotal role. As one, un one unknown author wrote, a lot of people have gone further than they thought they could because someone else thought that they could. This morning, I want to share a standalone message. I typically preach in a three to five week series, but I want to share a standalone message based on a bit of wisdom that was provided to me by a trusted voice of influence from years past. The name of the figure really isn't important for the purposes today. What's important are the person's words. And these were shared with me just really kind of casually in the midst of conversation and coaching and beyond. And this is what he told me, and this will provide a bit of a foundation for our discussion this morning. He said, James, you must continually ask three questions of yourself before God. So those of you who like to take notes, three questions that we should be asking ourselves before the Lord. Number one, am I doing the right thing? Number two, am I doing the right thing for the right reasons? And number three, am I trying to do the right thing for the right reasons in my own strength? Three questions, am I doing the right thing Am I doing it for the right reason? And am I trying to do it in my own strength? Tremendously practical questions, but there's deep spiritual principles that, under, that undergird these things. And I wanna spend a little bit of time unpacking these three questions and how they can and should be asked in our lives. Let's talk about number one. The question, am I doing the right thing? And I'm probably going to spend a greater portion of today's message looking at this question because that is the first of the three. This is a great question to ask of a current activity or a decided or cho chosen course of action. To ask the question of yourself in regards to something that you're already doing or something that you're looking to do, the simple question to pause and say, am I doing the right thing, is a question of tremendous practical and spiritual benefit. This question, as I have in my notes, is founded upon a few assumptions or premises. Number one, it's founded upon the supposition 
that there is such a thing as right and wrong. All lies this way. I know this is a basic point, but this is a point that our modern society greatly debates. Is there such a thing as right and wrong? When humanity wrestles with the question, is there such a thing as moral truth, our answer must be a resounding, help the pastor out. Yes. The Lord, through his word, has provided for us a vast body of moral commands and precepts that define and delineate right from wrong, good from evil, righteousness from wickedness, and beyond. For the sake of argument and for the sake of time, the Ten Commandments are a simple summary, if you will, of what I'm speaking of. What's the first commandment? Help the pastor out. A little bit of crowd help is welcome at this point. I'm going to put you on the spot. What's the first of the ten? No other gods. So if I'm entertaining the question, I want to worship a god other than the one revealed in the Bible, am I doing the right thing in that? The answer is a resounding no. Number two, make no idol, worship nothing else. Number three, help the pastor out. Do we need to do a series on the Ten Commandments? That might be coming this summer because it's a little rusty out there. If you want to cheat, turn to Exodus 20. You can follow along. I'm not going to read from it, but we're just going to go through. Number three, don't take the name of the Lord's name in vain. Number four, we don't like to talk about the fourth one. Something about the Sabbath. Well, I'm busy on Sundays. Well, are you really? Then we get into the ones that govern our interpersonal relationships. What's the first one, by the way? What's the very first law the Lord gave in the Ten Commandments, the fancy word, the Decalogue, that governs our relationships one with another? Honor your father and mother. Before he said, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't... You honor your parents. Why? Because typically, generally speaking, if you are willing to obey your parents and receive the wisdom that they impart, likely the other things are naturally going to fall into place in the course of life and living. So again, there are 10 commandments of some 600 plus, by the way, in the Old Testament that govern our system of right and wrong. So to ask the question, is there a right and wrong, again, is grounded in the conviction that there is such a thing as right and wrong. If you live your life apart from the conviction that there's such a thing as good and evil, it is going to be a very difficult life to live. Nothing will be fixed. Nothing will be absolute. You will be floating, and I wish you well because it will be a very unhappy journey. But number two, it's founded on the supposition that we're obliged to do that which is right. It's one thing to know that there is a right and wrong. It's another to realize that in Christ, we are under divine obligation to do that which is right. Now, I am grateful that the Lord is a forgiving God because I avail myself of that element of his nature often. Is anybody in the sound of my voice perfect and always get it right? No, we mess up. And thankfully, God is merciful and gracious and kind, and he's willing to let us confess our sins and find forgiveness. But do we have permission to live our lives as we desire and to sin freely and beyond? The answer to that is no. And I want to share the following verse with you. Titus chapter 2, don't turn there. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us or to save us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So we are to be a people who reject evil and pursue that that which is right. If you're going to be the try, try to be the kind of Christian that's always walking the fence, always trying to make excuse for unbiblical and bad behavior, you're going to fail question number one, and the Lord is not going to let you get past it. He's going to continually in love hound you regarding your attitude, regarding what he says to do. So am I doing the right thing in any area of life is a significant question. This is a question, by the way, that can be applied in a vast array of areas. Let's get specific. We can ask this question regarding our marriages. Am I doing the right thing in regards to my marriage? Am, men of God, am I loving my wife 
as Christ loved the church. Women. Is Misty downstairs? I want to be careful with this next one. Am I doing the right thing in regards to properly honoring my husband with reverence and submission as the word of the Lord commands? You want to know how many homes are just busted up and continually in disarray because the men are unloving and the women are disrespectful? And we say, Lord, why is, my, why is my marriage in such disarray? You're not doing the right thing. The failure to do the right thing produces a bad result every time. To what degree are my words and my deeds reflective of a biblical love? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'll step on all of our toes for a moment. The foundation for a healthy marriage is a biblical love, but that love is very different than the kind that we're used to in our modern culture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, penned by the Apostle Paul thousands of years ago, speaks to the nature, the characteristics of true love. This goes way beyond Hollywood in romance. This is getting to the core of what it really means to love. 1 Corinthians 13, I want to begin at verse 4. Help the pastor out with the first one. Love is... So husbands and wives, to ask yourself the question from time to time, am I doing the right thing in the way that I treat my spouse with patience? I epically fail at that one a lot. How many people are naturally good at patience? I have never met a truly, naturally patient person. Love is kind. Am I treating my spouse with a genuine kindness? Am I doing the right thing before them and before the Lord? It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. This next one is so hard. It keeps no record of wrongs. We all at times have conflict and arguments in our relationships, and it is so easy to delve into the history banks to pull up ammunition from the past. It keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And finally, love doesn't fail. It has this abiding nature where it's timeless and, in a sense, always timely. So, spouses, to ask yourself the question, am I doing the right thing before the Lord in regards to my marriage is step number one in having a healthier marriage. You can't solve a problem that you can't or haven't identified. How about raising your kids? Am I raising my kids according to biblical principles and precepts? Let me be specific. Am I doing right by the Lord and by my child by disciplining them in a way that God disciplines me? God disciplines those that he, there's always a loving element. There's always a restoring element to the discipline of the Lord. Can we say that at times? We can easily discipline out of a sense of anger or frustration. But to be, to be moved from that place of love, to do right by the Lord and by that child in that way. To what degree is my nurture in provision for this child right before the Lord? Is the example that I'm setting as a mother or a father reflective of the Lord's nature? It never ceases to amaze me how many people spend decades struggling understanding the nature of the Lord because they were given such rotten examples from mom and dad. So if you currently, in the sound of my voice, have a little one, the example that you set is illustrative of the Lord. It reflects him. Are you doing right by the Lord in setting a good example for that little one? Here's a tough question. To what degree am I comfortable in seeing my kids replicate my character? Am I doing right by them by setting them a consistent, godly example? Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know what the operative word in that sentence to me is? Train. Train up a child. That's a multifaceted term. Parents, mom and dad, regardless of how old the little one is, are you doing right by them and by the Lord? Am I doing the right thing? How about the way that you are at work? Is the manner in which you conduct yourself at work reflective of the Lord? Am I right before the Lord in terms of genuine industry and integrity? Do you know how often God's word condemns laziness? When you have some time, go on Google and just type in what does the Bible say about being lazy. It is brutal and fierce. 
God condemns it soundly and continually. Is the manner in which I treat my, sub my superiors, my boss, right before the Lord? We justify bad attitudes toward our bosses. But what does the Word have to say about that? Am I doing right before him? It's amazing to me how many Christians speak so poorly of their supervisors. Might be you. How about the way you treat those who are your subordinates? If, you, if you're in charge of a department, if you, if you have some degree of oversight, what did the people who work for you and in a sense under you have to say about you? Are you doing right by them? Are you the kind of person that brings life to your workplace or are you the one that shows up in the morale and the productivity dives? How many people, in the sound of my voice, there's that employee that when they show up, things automatically begin to go south? I work here on my own, essentially. Well, Patty, she's a new hire. But for years, I worked on my own, so I was always my, my best friend and my worst enemy. But every job, every industry, every place of work has people that are life-giving and people that are just not. If you're part of that latter group, please don't be a part of that. Please look at what the Lord would have to say to you regarding the right way to do things. To what degree is your work life connected to your relationship with the Lord? I love what it says in Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, that's a big umbrella term. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I could continue to go on and on and on. How about friendships? Am I honoring the Lord? in terms of my friendships? Am I doing right by him and by them? Proverbs 18, 24. I'm going to read a few Proverbs to you. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Am I right in the Lord by my friends, by being someone that they can rely on? Iron sharp as iron, according to Proverbs 27, 17. And one man sharpens another. Am I doing right by the Lord and by my friends by the degree to which I help to improve them in their walks with the Lord? Proverbs 15, verse 22. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Am I doing right by the Lord and by my friends by being a voice of godly counsel that tries to steer them in the right direction? And finally, for this point, John 15, verse 3, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Am I doing right before the Lord and in the context of my relationships by being sacrificial, or is it always just about me? We could talk about money. We could talk about the way that we spend our time. We could talk about the use of our talents and gifts. Please borrow my notes. I'm literally skipping pages of notes and Bible verses. Because the question, am I doing right, when applied to a specific facet of life and living, is a probing, difficult, but at times necessary questions. If you ask yourself the question, am I doing the right thing, and the answer is no, repent. It's that simple. Stop what you're doing. If you say, am I doing the right thing, Lord? And you and him both agree that the answer is no. Don't persist down that road. He's only going to lovingly hound you and keep trying to hook you back in the right direction. If you can answer that question sincerely with a yes, then let's move on to question number two. Am I doing the right thing for the right reasons? If question number one has to do with a sense of morality, question number two has to do with motivations. God is not just concerned with what you do, but why you do it. That is a vital point that many believers stumble on. God is not just concerned with actions, but he measures the underlying and unseen attitudes of the heart. There is a beautiful truth in Scripture that I personally derive a lot of peace and comfort from. And the truth is that God knows everything. God knows everything, of, I'll just personalize, he knows everything about my life. He knows everything that I'm going through, everything that I'm facing, every circumstance that weighs me down, every sense of worry and concern and anxiety that I have. He knows the Goliaths, in a sense, that I, little James Foley, face. And there's, there's comfort in that, there's peace in that. But there's also something sobering about it. The Lord knows everything. He sees it all. 
Hebrews says the following, verse 13 of chapter 4. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is important because many people, many believers, you are actively trying to do the right thing. But you're doing it for the wrong reason. And when the Lord is going to deal with you, especially at the time of judgment, it's not just what you did, but why you did it. He's going to look at. Let's, let's be specific. Let's, talk, let's go back to the theme of marriage for a moment. We can lovingly serve our spouses, but we can do it for the wrong reasons. Go out of your way to, to treat your spouse well, buy him or her something nice, but all with the ulterior motive of future reciprocation. I'll treat them well today because tomorrow I'm going to want to be treated in the exact same way. That happens. We serve, we do the right thing, we wash the dishes, we vacuum, but deep down it's not really just to serve them and honor them. It's because we're going to eventually want something out of them and it makes sense to build up a sense of or degree of capital that you can draw upon for a future time. We can discipline our kids, which is a good thing, with an ugly attitude. With an ugly attitude, one that doesn't honor the Lord at all. We can, we can work in such a way that we notify our boss of issues that a coworker is having, but it's not really for the betterment of that coworker or the department. It's to make yourself look good and or to get that person in trouble. We can make connections with people. We can build friendships, but for the purpose of getting out of them. We can, we can work to make friends. I have this in my notes. We can work to make friends with somebody who has a truck because we have to move next week. For years, Hefe had a truck. You sold that thing because of all the best friends that you suddenly had that needed you to move. And then when you got the little car, no one all of a sudden knew Hefe. So why do you make the friend? Is it to get something out of people? Why are you so interested all of a sudden in networking? Do you have a need that all of a sudden you need other, to pull other people in? In the, in the realm of giving, we can give a lot. You can cut a big check this morning. But is it for the high five that might come with it? Or for the recognition? For the applause? This morning, you, you could do something demonstrable in the way of leading worship. Or playing guitar. But is it to be seen by your peers as someone deeply spiritual and who loves the Lord? Let's get into the word, Matthew chapter 6, because this is what Jesus targets brutally. Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to read a little bit. This is all part of the Sermon on the Mount. Because again, Christ is underlining the fact that he does not care just about what you do, but why you do it. Matthew 6, I want to read from verse 1. The Lord speaking to the crowds who were gathered thousands of years ago and to the crowd that is gathered today. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by... That's the key. The issue is not the practicing of righteousness. Doing the right thing is always good, but with the intent of being seen by them. If you do this, what does he say? You will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. How many of you, you want, you want reward from, have, from the Lord? You want to be rewarded when you stand before him. Well, you better take some inventory of what's happening below the surface because you can do the right thing for the wrong reasons and it totally negate everything that you offered. It's all tainted. When you give to the needy, how many folks realize giving to the needy is a good thing? We should be this kind of person. But when you do it, don't announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, for the purpose of being honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Let's skip down to verse 5. When you pray, how many folks, you realize praying is a good thing that we should do a lot of. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners. Why? To be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. 
Skip way down to verse 16. When you fast, we all love to eat, right? But fasting is a part of the thing that we have to look at from time to time. When you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to, to, to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And I want to stop there. Even good things, deeply spiritual things, like giving, like fasting, like prayer, things that from this pulpit we commend and say should be done, these things can be absolutely worthless before the Lord and stained if they're done for the wrong reason. I have to wonder how many preachers, and I, I think of this often with myself, how many preachers are going to accumulate absolutely zero reward from the Lord, not because they failed to preach, but because they preach for the purpose other than honoring the Lord. I knew people, I've known people in Bible school and beyond, they wanted to preach the word because they wanted a pulpit and they wanted a platform. You know what that is? Pride. Good things done with bad motivations are worthless. We must all, the Bible says, appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Paul talks about a fire being passed over our works to expose what they truly are. Gang, your motivations matter. These truths drive me to the following text. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So if you can ask question number one, am I doing the right thing? And the answer is yes, fantastic, high five. But if you get to question two and it's I'm doing the right thing for the wrong reason, you ready? Repent. Yield that thing before the Lord. Ask him to renew a right spirit within you so that you might do the right thing with the right motivation. Finally, question number three. Am I doing the right thing in my own power? If you have chosen a course of action that's right before God, and it's done with the right intentions, it is still possible to mess this thing up. And I put forth in my notes that the following reality likely accounts for many of the areas of, of failure that we experience as believers. We're trying to do good things for the right reasons, but in our own power and according to our own capacities, and we keep hitting walls. Let me give you a few examples. Many people, many sincere believers try to live for God, try to keep his commands according to their own strength. That maybe if they just tried harder, prayed more, fasted more, gave more, did more before the Lord, if they offered more self-effort, more sense of self-industry, they could make themselves into loving, peaceful, joyful, self-controlled people. The answer to that is no. This is a recipe for self-condemnation, self-defeat, and frustration. If your Christianity continually feels frustrated, defeated, and condemned, it is likely because you're trying to abide by a checklist according to your own power rather than letting him work in and through you. Because who ultimately is responsible for making you loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, and kind, self-controlled, and beyond? It's not necessarily your work. It's the Spirit of God in and through you. You want to know what your job is? To submit and to yield. To daily say, Lord, your calling is so great. I know that I can't get there on my own. But with you, all things become possible. When we sing that song, nothing is impossible with you, we believe that. We teach that. We maintain that. God can transform a wretch and a wreck just like me, as the song says. We don't sugarcoat the fact that left to our own devices, we are all, without exceptions, train wrecks. But the grace of the Lord active within us, the Spirit of God working and conforming us into the image of Jesus, that's where the power is. 
if you're continually frustrated at how much you fail, if you're always looking at yourself and condemning yourself, you're looking in the wrong direction and putting the emphasis on the wrong person. Look to the Lord. And according to Jesus, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain or abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. It's automatic. It's going to happen. If you are in sync with him, you will become fruitful. If you're lacking fruit, it's because your connection with him has become somehow severed or diseased. Many people, number two, try to serve the Lord in their own strength. How many Christians are going to go forth and conquer the world for Jesus and win the lost and beyond? But it's all predicated upon how hard they can try and how gifted they are. You know, when the Lord first called his apostles, he spent some time with them, three years, working with them daily, sending them off briefly, but they'd come back, they'd give a report. He dies, he comes back, he spends some time with them, and when he goes back to glory, he does not automatically send them forth to go. You know what he actually says first? You wait. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but you stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And he reaffirmed it at a later point. You will receive power when the Spirit of God comes upon you, and then you will be my witnesses at the micro level and then, of course, at the macro level. Many people try to win the lost based upon how hard they can try, how diligent they are, what kind of a script they can memorize. I am not knocking those things. Please hear me clearly. I'm not just saying sit on your couch and say, God, do the work. He uses us. But don't put the emphasis just on you. Let him work through you. He is the one who has to save people anyway. You want to know how many people Pastor James has ever saved or will ever save? Zero. Jesus is the one who saves. We just sign, function as signposts who point the way. And that's a vital role that the Lord has called us to play. You play your role, let him play his, and let's see what kind of work we can really get done. Many people in the sound of my voice and beyond try to navigate difficult seasons in times of crisis in their own strength. How many people in the valley seasons of life Grab the reins out of Jesus' hands and say, I got this. I've been a Christian for 20 years, a pastor for 15. I have never seen that go well. I can speak extensively from my own life in the seasons where I tried to grab the reins. It didn't go well. I'm really good at finding ditches and having my little, my little ship all shipwrecked on the... On, uh, it's bad but to say, Lord, I don't have it in me to navigate this crisis. Lord, this is bigger than me. Lord, I can't do this apart from you, but I'm trusting in you. I'm looking to your leadership. I'm looking to your strength. I'm looking for the wisdom that you so freely offer. I think we'd have a lot better luck against our personal Goliaths if we took a page out of David's book, and I move to a conclusion with this. When David stood before the towering Goliath, he did not say to Goliath, excuse me, do you know who I am? Because the answer was a resounding no. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Listen to the confidence in this, not rooted in himself, but in the Lord. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. And this is a little graphic, but it's in there. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. That's Bible, by the way. Please don't go forth and practice this on someone that cuts you off. Please don't make these <laughs> threats. This very day I will give the carcasses of your army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know, not that I'm king, but that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. This sounds like the book of Zechariah. It's not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. 
Stop trying to fight your own battles. Stop trying to proverbially and spiritually man up. It's beyond you. It's okay to say that. The Lord actually prefers that we just operate from that as a starting point rather than try to do it in our own strength, fail, and then give it over to him. The sooner that we just look to him by faith, the better off we will be. So three questions to ask yourself as I finally conclude this message. Am I doing the right thing? To pause and to honestly ask the Lord to help you navigate that question, you will save yourself from so much heartache. Am I doing the right thing, Lord? Number two, am I doing it, God, for the right reasons? If my reasons are remiss, expose them to me. Let me see them that I might repent. And number three, God, am I trying to do the right thing for the right reasons, but according to my own capacities and not yours? Oh, that we were the kind of church that would pause and take the time to wrestle with such questions. I think that we would be the better for it, and also produce the more in light of it. Father, we come before you as we close, and we, and we humble ourselves, because it is so easy for us just to steamroll into action without really pausing before you to consider. Lord, we all have to make decisions daily. Help us to be mindful of what your word says, to ask the question, am I doing the right thing? And if so, Lord, may the motivations be pure. May it be rooted in those things that your word commends and calls for. And God, help us to serve you, not by our own strength, but by yours. We are so weak on our own. Apart from you, we can do precisely nothing. But in you, all of a sudden, all things become possible. As we go our separate ways, I pray, Lord, over the course of this week that you would bring these people and those listening online back to these principles. May there be that moment of prayerful conversation where you help them to navigate one, two, three, or more of these questions. As we go our separate ways, do keep, bless, protect, and preserve in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen.